Friends, it's a pleasure to be with you all here tonight. And um, yes, uh, the topic of my discussion tonight is the first century, the formative age. Uh, but since we only have about an hour, I'm going to have to leave some things out. I hope you don't mind. But really, what, I'm, what I want to share with you, of course, you know that Shoghi Fendi talked about uh, the idea that the um, dispensation of Baha'u'llah would be divided into three great ages. The first was the heroic age, which took place over the ministries of the Bab and Baha'u'llah and Abdu Baha. And then in the future, the fulfillment of his dispensation is the promised golden age, when uh, the uh, concepts and ideas and promises embedded in Baha'u'llah's teachings would be fully realized uh, in the world. And what connects the two is the formative age of the faith, where we have to learn to do, uh, it began with the passing of Abdu'l Baha, it will continue uh, into uh, the future until we're able to uh, establish this golden age. And this is the age really of uh, the work that it will take to translate Baha'u'llah's teachings into reality and action. Now, some of you might have wished that you were born into that golden age when you would see all of these promises of the faith fulfilled. And some of you might even have wished to have been alive in the time when you could have met Baha'u'llah and been with him or met Abdu Baha and so on. Unfortunately for you, you're born in the formative age of the faith, and that means you're going to have to roll up your sleeves and work so that we can figure out how to put these teachings into action and basically create the foundation uh, that would allow for the emergence of the golden age of the faith. So we have to keep in mind then, well, what, what does it mean to be a Baha'i? Why did Baha'u'llah come? What has he called us to do? If we're supposed to do some work, well, we need to understand what exactly is that work supposed to be. And in the Agan, for example, Baha'u'llah talks about the idea that the manifestation of God comes to transform the inner and outer life of humanity. And we see through uh, uh, a wide range of exhortations in the text, insights into what it means to be a Baha'i and what we should be doing. We're told not to live a life uh, in pursuit of our own personal interests. We're told to do some good to every person whose path you cross. Uh, we're told to be the champions of every victim of oppression. And gradually, by studying these things, we learn to put into place uh, those principles and concepts in our own life. And Abdu'l Baha also tells us that the aims of the Baha'is are these, to raise aloft the banner of the most great peace, to eradicate the causes of war and conflict in every land, to gather all the nations and peoples within the shadow of the all-embracing tabernacle of God, to eliminate prejudice, whether racial, national, religious, sectarian, or political, from the face of the globe, so that all nations may merge into one nation, and thus may the world of creation attain unto well-being and repose. So, as we look at the news, maybe we go on the internet, we see that the world is anything but in a state of well-being and repose. And so there's a lot to do then over the course of this formative age to try to understand what Baha'u'llah said and to put it into action so that these, what he envisioned becomes a reality in the world. And the social structures uh, are transformed so that peace can be established prejudice eliminated, and so on. Now, in uh, one of his early writings, Shoghi Effendi uh, mentioned the idea. He said, I consider it my duty to warn every beginner in the faith that the promised glories of the sovereignty which the Baha'i teachings foreshadow can be revealed only in the fullness of time. So oftentimes, we learn about the Baha'i teachings, we see all these wonderful promises of Baha'u'llah, and then we go into our Baha'i communities, and we expect that all of these teachings would be manifest in the community. And sometimes we're shocked to see that, no, actually, those people 
who I expected to be so perfect are actually a lot like me, not so perfect. And so then we have to realize what, what the guardian says here is that no, the promises will be fulfilled in the future. Our job is to begin to work where we are and gradually put these teachings into effect. Now in other of his letters, Shoghi Effendi talked about the idea that uh, he, in, in the very early stages of his ministry, he, he told the Baha'is that it was far too early for them to fully appreciate and understand the teachings, and that they would actually have to work a full century to begin to understand some of the depths of the implications of Abdu'l Baha's will and testament. So, for example, in 1930, he wrote, the contents of the will of the master are far too much for the present generation to comprehend. It needs at least a century of actual working before the treasures of wisdom hidden in it can be revealed. That was a letter written on his behalf. And then he himself wrote, how vast is the revelation of Baha'u'llah, how great the magnitude of his blessings showered upon humanity in this day. And yet how poor, how inadequate our conception of their significance and glory. This generation stands too close to so colossal a revelation, to appreciate in their full measure the infinite possibilities of his faith, the unprecedented character of his cause, and the mysterious dispensations of his providence. And again, he wrote, we're called by our beloved master in his will and testament, not only to adopt it, the new world order unreservedly, but also to unveil its merit to all the world. To attempt to estimate its full value and grasp its exact significance after so short a time since its inception would be premature and presumptuous on our part. We must trust to time and the guidance of God's universal house of justice to obtain a clearer and fuller understanding of its provisions and implications. Now this was in 1930, about nine years after the passing of Abdu'l Baha, nine years into the beginning of the formative age of the faith, and Shoghi Effendi was saying, it's too early to really understand the full implications of what we're doing, the full implications of the promises of Abdu'l Baha's will and testament. And it'll take at least a century of actual working, and we have to trust the time and the guidance of the House of Justice to do it. Well, here we are now, uh, about eight years from the end of the first century of the formative age, 90 years have gone by in which the Baha'i community has worked systematically to try to implement what Baha'u'llah called the Baha'i community to and what we're called to in the larger Baha'i writings. So the question becomes, well, what is it that Shoghi Effendi thought the Baha'is couldn't understand back in 1930? And after some 90 years of effort, is there some insight that we can have into what those things were? Now, I'm gonna share with you some of my own thoughts about it. You might wanna reflect on the question yourself. There are many possibilities that we could understand of what we know now that we didn't know some 80, 90 years ago. And uh, having those insights then will help us have a deeper understanding of the work that we're engaged in. So I'm gonna share with you a few points, if time permits, maybe as many as four points, to just some of the most important things I think that we can see now that we couldn't understand at this time. Now, uh, we also know, for example, that it's the House of Justice itself, as Shoghi Effendi clearly explained, that's the source of the guidance, that's the protection of the Baha'i community, the members of the Universal House of Justice, and not the body of those who either directly or indirectly elect them, have thus been made the recipients of the divine guidance, which is at once the lifeblood and ultimate safeguard of this revelation. Also, uh, Abdu'l Baha made it clear that the House of Justice doesn't decide things on the basis of its own opinions. So we can't just look at decisions that the House of Justice made and say, well, that's the decision of this member or that's the decision of that member. Abdu'l Baha said, let it not be imagined that the House of Justice will take any decision according to its own concepts and opinions. God forbid. The Supreme House of Justice will take decisions and establish laws 
through the inspiration and confirmation of the Holy Spirit, because it is in the safekeeping and under the shelter and protection of the ancient beauty. And obedience to its decision is a bounden and essential duty and an absolute obligation, and there is no escape for anyone. And he said in one of his talks that, uh, that the, whoever believes that the House of Justice has erred has indeed ascribed this error to the blessed beauty because it's Baha'u'llah who set up the system. It's Baha'u'llah who set up the structure, the framework of his covenant, and called the Baha'is to turn to the House of Justice as the center of authority in the faith and guaranteed that it would be under the protection uh, of his inspiration. And so it's decisions Abdu'l Baha explained in this talk are not subject, they're not based on the opinions of its own members. Now, an another thing Abdu'l Baha talked about is the idea that while the friends are free to put forward their views and that certain individuals excel in their learning and their understanding of the faith, yet whatever an individual has to say, it has no authority unless it's endorsed by the Universal House of Justice. Because if the friends follow in the footsteps of uh, religions of the past when there was no such covenant, the conclusions of individuals and scholars would definitely lead to differences and result in schism, division, and dispersion. But when the decision comes from the House of Justice that's elected from this process involving all the friends in the world, then the friends could accept it and be united. So now uh, we know that currently on the internet or in the future, these t attacks and whisperings will continue to go on. But for the Baha'i community itself, it sees firmly established in the explicit text the authority of the covenant. And so it knows the, the center to which it should turn, which is really two centers. On the one hand, the book itself. So the writings of Baha'u'llah and then the authoritative interpretations of Abdu'l Baha and Shoghi Effendi. But then, beyond that, is then the authority of the Universal House of Justice, which uh, is empowered to um, provide for guidance on matters that are not in the book, matters in the book that are obscure, or matters in the book that the friends disagree about. So you see this quote from Abdu'l Baha, he, he describes, in a certain sense, a perfect kind of uh, balance. Either it's in the book and we see it and we all agree on it, or it's not in the book and then the House of Justice has the authority to speak. Or we disagree about what is in the book and so the House of Justice has the authority to speak. Or it's not clear what the book says and then the House of Justice has the authority to speak. So we always have a point to which we can turn. So this is something that we couldn't understand and it took us most of the century really to understand it. One way we thought, why do we have a guardian? Why do we have an administration? The next minute we think, how can we do without a guardian? But now we can see the framework for the a basis of the covenant is well laid, well established in the text, and this framework will guide us uh, for, for the rest of the centuries of the dispensation. Now, one of the most important, I think, is uh, an understanding of the covenant in the context of a historical perspective. If we think back in 1921, we know Abdu'l Baha passed away. And up to that point, the Baha'is didn't really know in detail what would happen to the faith after Abdu'l Baha passed away. They had heard about the Universal House of Justice. They maybe read a few quotes about that. Uh, but otherwise, the generality of the community didn't know what the arrangements were until Abdu'l Baha's will and testament was read and translated and shared with the community. And suddenly, new insights were presented to the community's eyes. Uh, primarily was the appointment of the guardian. Now, up until that time, nobody really anticipated that there would be a guardian. Even Shoghi Effendi himself was reported to have said that he had no idea that Abdu'l Baha would call him to do such a thing. He thought perhaps he would be called upon to arrange for the election of the Universal House of Justice. But he, he didn't anticipate the idea that he would be appointed as the guardian. And so right from the beginning then of the very earliest part of the first uh, of this century, first century of the formative age, 
different points of confusion arose among the Baha'is. Some of them, for example, weren't so sure about Baha'i administration, the whole concept conveyed in the will and testament, and then gradually Shoghi Effendi called upon the Baha'is to start building local and national spiritual assemblies. And people had, for different reasons, thought that, well, the Baha'i faith can't be organized, and uh, that it was a spiritual movement, and there wasn't supposed to be any structure, misunderstanding certain things that um, Abdul Baha had said, or poor translation of some of Abdul Baha's statements. There were outright challenges to the administration by some individuals who proposed alternative structures in place of the administrative structure Shoghi Effendi was trying to create. There was one uh, foolish woman who produced the idea that Abdul Baha's will and testament was a forgery. And so she challenged that and created some turmoil in the community. There were some who thought that Shoghi Effendi was too young to guide the affairs of the faith, and that the House of Justice should be formed right away in order to assist him, and so on, and on and on. And so even as Shoghi Effendi tried to unite the community and um, guide it in the unfoldment of the steps necessary to create the administrative structure of the faith, all these challenges were taking place. It wasn't just challenges from the old covenant breakers outside the community, but questions, whisperings, uh, uh, various questions that were arising and discussed among the friends. And so uh, Shoghi Fendi had to carefully educate the community, gradually resolve these difficulties, bring out the tablets, and clarify these issues for the friends. Now, interestingly enough then, the faith began to unfold under the ministry of the Guardian for 36 years. Until then, Shoghi Fendi passed away. And at that time then, he passed away without having been able to appoint a successor according to the specific requirements of Abdu'l Baha's will and testament. So suddenly another ripple of concern went through the community. How can we not have the continuation of the guardianship? How can the guardianship come to an end? So on the one hand, in 1921, people wondered how could we possibly have a guardian? And then in 1957, people are wondering, how could we possibly not have a guardian? And so this is the process of the friends trying to keep up in a certain sense, trying to understand uh, the implications of Abdul Baha's will and testament. And so uh, then it became clear with the passing of the guardian that, well, because of the strict requirements of Abdul Baha and his will and testament, there was nobody who met the criteria that Abdul Baha specified that Shoghi Effendi could appoint. And then people realized that, well, actually in the Akdas, Baha'u'llah had a passage where he anticipated a time when the line of guardians would come to an end and that that would possibly even happen before the Universal House of Justice was established in the world. So when finally the House of Justice was established, it gradually began to explain this. Until that time, nobody had the authority to really speak to the issue. But when the House of Justice was established, according to the criteria that Abdul Baha laid out, then it could begin to um, point out and explain the issues. Gradually, it became clear that nobody had the right, according to the explicit word of Abdul Baha, to claim the station of the guardianship. Only Shoghi Effendi could appoint his successor because the will gave the criteria and nobody fit those criteria. He could not speak to the matter uh, and he appointed no one. And then uh, following that, Abdul Baha made it clear that nobody could claim the station and if questions arose, those questions should be referred to the House of Justice. And the House of Justice later clarified that um, that there was no way that it could legislate to appoint a guardian. And then we became clear on the idea that, well, this was actually the evolutionary path of the, um, of the uh, unfoldment of the covenant. Now, when we look at the will and testament, as the House of Justice explained at a later date, an attentive reading of Abdu'l Baha's will makes it clear that he did not indicate a predestined outcome but he did provide for a number of circumstances which, depending on future conditions, might eventually confront the faith. So, for example, there was the possibility that um, the House of Justice could have been established 
before the guardian was old enough to assume his responsibility as the guardian. That took place in the early 1900s when Abdu'l Baha's life was in jeopardy. And that's the time that Abdu'l Baha wrote the second part of his will and testament, which only speaks about the House of Justice and doesn't speak about the guardianship. So that was one historic possibility. Abdu'l Baha wrote those passages in his will. He also arranged with the Afnan and the hands of the cause to be able, if anything had happened to him, to form the House of Justice at that time. Then later, uh, that, that God, uh, thanks be to God, that didn't unfold. But then when Abdu'l Baha passed away, well, Shoghi Effendi was able to assume his responsibilities as guardian. Then he considered very early on whether he could form the Universal House of Justice. So if he did form it at that early stage, then the guardian and the House of Justice would have operated simultaneously. But he realized as he looked around, as he talked with some of the Baha'is, as he examined the conditions of the faith in the world, that actually the foundation didn't exist for the election of the Universal House of Justice. So he focused the Baha'is on building their local and national assemblies until such time as the foundation and the pillars could be laid, and then the House of Justice could be established on top of that foundation. And that's eventually, as we know, that's what historically unfolded. But as far as the Baha'is are concerned, the issue of the covenant is now crystal clear. Baha'u'llah laid the foundation of his covenant. He appointed Abdu'l Baha as, as the center of the covenant. Abdu'l Baha revealed his will and testament. Although there were many possibilities that could have unfolded in time, what actually unfolded was uh, Shoghi Effendi became guardian, acted uh, without the House of Justice being established, the line of guardians came to an end because of strict obedience to the criteria of Abdu'l Baha's will. And then the House of Justice in turn was elected according to the cr exact criteria of Abdu'l Baha's uh, uh, directions. He said, at whatever time all the beloved of God in each country appoint their delegates, and these in turn elect their representatives, and these representatives elect a body, that body shall be regarded as the supreme house of justice. That is all. And so as we know, the members of the National Assemblies gathered in the Holy Land and they selected among uh, all those eligible who they wanted to be the members and then the house of justice came into being uh, in 1963. Now, another uh, thing that we can understand much more clearly than we could in 1930 is the great latitude and the authority of the Universal House of Justice. For example, we know that there's some specific things mentioned in the text which talk about uh, decisions that will have to be made uh, by the Universal House of Justice. So, for example, there's one statement by Shoghi Effendi where he talks about the need to elect national assemblies uh, on an annual basis and then says that in the future, the House of Justice will decide on this matter. So the House of Justice can make a different decision. National assemblies don't have to be formed every year. Or for example, there are certain questions related to the Baha'i calendar, like how do you fit the, um, the uh, lunar anniversaries of the birth of the Bab and Baha'u'llah into a solar calendar? Abdul Baha and Shoghi Effendi said, that's a question that the House of Justice will decide. But actually, there are many, many statements of Shoghi Effendi that create a broad framework in which the House of Justice can act. For example, he talked about it is the House of Justice whose function is to lay more definitely the broad lines that must guide the future activities and administration of the movement. Many decisions of Shoghi Effendi are, are, about the administration were made as a temporary measure to guide the Baha'is until such time as the House of Justice was established and then could review all these issues. He said, when this supreme body will have been properly established, it will have to consider afresh the whole situation related to the administration and lay down the principle which shall direct, so long as it deems advisable, the affairs of the cause. And he said the House of Justice will lay down new methods, establish a firm and inviolable constitution, and will initiate comprehensive projects and undertakings. Then all the meetings of the friends, be they particular or public, local or national, will come under its shadow, deriving inspiration from it, 
and will be sustained by it. He talked about the launching of worldwide enterprises destined to be embarked upon in future epochs that will symbolize the unity and coordinate the un and unify the activities of the national assemblies under the direction of the Universal House of Justice. He said the House of Justice will proceed and devise and carry out important undertakings, worldwide activities, and the establishment of glorious institutions. By this means, the renown of the cause of God will become worldwide, and its light will illumine the whole earth. And again, he said, when this most great edifice shall be reared on such an immovable foundation, God's purpose, wisdom, universal truths, mysteries, and realities of the kingdom, which the mystic revelation of Baha'u'llah has deposited within the will and testament of Abdu Baha, shall gradually be revealed and made manifest. So the role of the House of Justice is actually quite broad. Its powers wide. It's capable of doing everything necessary to ensure that uh, the promises enshrined in Baha'u'llah's teachings are manifested and uh, a new uh, world order is rolled out under its guidance. One example of uh, the operation of the House of Justice is in the idea of the enfoldment of these various teaching plans. So uh, the plans were initially begun by Shoghi Effendi. He couldn't actually start at the beginning of the formative age. He had to wait till he first built the administrative structure. It took 16 years after the passing of Abdu'l Baha before the first plan could be introduced in North America, the first seven-year plan. Gradually, he taught the Baha'is how to uh, implement these plans. Gradually, other national communities began to implement them and so on. And, but basically, within the framework of the efforts of Baha'i communities, Shoghi Effendi left it open to national spiritual assemblies to devise their own teaching structures. Uh, pretty much universally, there was a national teaching committee of some kind. But then after that, it was left to national assemblies to devise. And national assemblies did different things along these lines. Well, initially, the House of Justice did the same thing. But more recently, it started to, uh, beginning with, for example, the creation of regional Baha'i councils uh, in 97, and the uh, training institutes in 96 began to create institutional structures that would begin to guide the systematic unfoldment of the teaching work in various parts of the world. Gradually, that also began to encompass cluster level agencies. And now, all the national communities are under the framework of a system of uh, institutions aimed at guiding the process of uh, the expansion and consolidation work, all directed, all formed uh, by the Universal House of Justice itself. Another um, example is the, uh, the power of the House of Justice to guide the unfoldment of the administrative order of the faith. Um, from the beginning of his ministry, Shoghi Effendi talked about the unfoldment of local and national spiritual assemblies. But it wasn't near till the end of his ministry that he started talking about the other arm of the administration, which is the hands of the cause. Uh, so it wasn't until 1951, six years before he passed away, that he uh, appointed living hands of the cause. Soon after that, called for the formation of auxiliary boards. And then, just a few days before his passing, uh, called for the final piece, which was the establishment of the protection board, e equal to the propagation board. So obviously, Shoghi Effendi gave 36 years of guidance uh, for the work of the uh, elected arm, but only a few years of guidance, and even up to the last moment before he passed away, in the days before, guidance about the, the arm of the learned. So when the House of Justice was formed, it continued to provide guidance, but then started to talk about how these two arms would come together, how they would collaborate, how they would interact. And initially, it was a bunch of challenges, a bunch of questions. The House of Justice would answer these questions. Finally, uh, the House of Justice was able to um, prepare this document 
called the Institution of the Counselors, which then give a holistic picture of the Baha'i administrative structure and how the uh, uh, elected and appointed armed would collaborate uh, in their efforts. So all of this was based on the unfolding guidance given by the House of Justice. So at any point, we can't say that, gee, I thought that the purpose of the hands or the uh, purpose of the counselors was thus and so. But now I see that actually they're being asked to do something else. So maybe there's a problem here or maybe there's a challenge here. Actually, it's the opposite. It might be different than what we have in mind, but in fact, the House of Justice is educating us about the direction. We're moving closer to the implications that are in Baha'u'llah's teachings about the nature of the administrative order, not further away from it. Now, a, a third element uh, of, uh, that I want to bring out, something quite different than we could understand in 1930, 30, something that we can understand much better today, is this systematic process about learning about the growth and development of the Baha'i community. Now, as I mentioned before, when Shoghi Effendi uh, became the guardian after Abdul Baha's passing, he immediately had to start educating the Baha'is about how they do their business. They didn't really understand it too well. They, they didn't understand the administration. He would give them guidance. They would struggle with it. They would do different things. They would make mistakes. They would ask questions, and gradually he would uh, add clarity to their work. So, for example, with regard to the administration, there was a time when people would, for example, elect 15 members to their local spiritual assembly or something like that. There was one point where at national convention they would have nominations for who should be elected to the national spiritual assembly at the national convention. One national spiritual assembly elected uh, one national community elected alternate members to the National Spiritual Assembly. So there were nine members of the National Assembly and nine alternate members of the National Assembly. In case a member couldn't attend a meeting, one of the alternates would show up in his place. So for some reason, you're laughing about that. <laughs> well, see, the reason you're laughing is because our, our forebears made all those mistakes for you. So now it's very clear to you, well, of course you don't nominate people, and yes, you only elect nine people, and no, of course we don't have alternate members. Because they made mistakes, because Shoghi Effendi had to clarify in response to a variety of questions, a lot of issues related to administration, well, we know what the answer to those questions are now, because we learned from what those friends did and the mistakes they made and the guidance they received. The same thing took place in the area of learning about growth. So for example, until 1937, we weren't able to put in place a systematic plan of action. And then at the prompting of Shoghi Effendi, the Baha'is of North America implemented the first plan. But then there was a lot to learn about the teaching work. So for example, at one time, the way that we spread the faith to new places was somebody would travel teach, they would get on a boat, they would sail to different ports, they would get out, they would have a public meeting, they would pass out some pamphlets, get on the boat, and go down to the next port, and so on. So gradually, it became clear that, no, actually, it would be better to move to a place, stay there, until you raised up a local spiritual assembly. And so the concept of pioneering was born. And so in one letter to one national community, the Shoghi Effendi explained that this method had proven by, the, by experience to be the most effective way in spreading the faith to a new area. And so he erected, recommended that that national community adopt that and put it as part of its systematic plans. Now the concept of pioneering internationally or in the home front is part of all of our plans. But there are times when it wasn't, and the time when we had less effective methods, and gradually we learned uh, how to have more effective methods. So this process of learning was already underway. We might not have been conscious of it, but Shoghi Effendi surely was. And now in the recent series of plans, the House, beginning in 1996, the House of Justice has called us to this consciousness. Now it's not enough that the World Center directs us and it learns for us in a certain sense over our head, but no, we too now have to engage in a process of learning uh, how to 
uh, understand the guidance, how to translate it into effective action, and how to build patterns of uh, community life that would welcome others, give us an opportunity to expose them uh, to Baha'i worship, to Baha'i study, to the education of their children, to the application of the teachings. And in this way, they would be with us and learn with us, and the process of expansion and consolidation would go hand in hand. Uh, during the time of Shoghi Effendi, near the end of his ministry, we learned how to reach large number of people. And so thousands of people became Baha'is in some countries. In, in India, hundreds of thousands of people became Baha'is in a short period. But we didn't know how to combine this uh, expansion process with a sustained consolidation process. So one of the things the House of Justice pointed out was, well, we need to learn how to systematically develop human resources from among the new believers so that they can actively become involved in the work of the community right from the beginning. And that's where the idea uh, of the institute uh, process was born. And so uh, we've been learning then uh, ever since about uh, how to engage uh, in this process of community building. One example of how this learning takes place is the example of the Mashal Kalaskar. So on the one hand, uh, from, from kind of like the international level down, we've been building continental temples. This is the mother temple of the West, not just the national temple of the United States or the local temple of Wilmette. It's the mother temple of the West. And um, so gradually in each continent, we built a temple and so on. Then at the same time, we were working from the grassroots to begin to learn how to put the concept of the Mashal Azkar into practice in the life of our community. So the idea of devotional meeting is not just another thing to do in your community. It's learning how to kind of plant the seed of the Mashal Azkar in that community. And how do we grow that spirit of collective worship? And fan that flame and help it expand until it could embrace everybody within our cluster, not just the Baha'is, but an opportunity for collective worship of everybody who wants to partake in it, which is exactly what the Matrical Azkar is supposed to be about, a place of worship for everybody without any exception. So we're building from the continental level. We're also building from the grassroots level through our devotional meetings and so on. And um, in one passage, for example, Abdu'l Baha talks about this bottom-up kind of approach. He said, the Mashukal Askar is of great import. The purpose is this, a location should be designated even if it be limited to a place beneath the dirt and stone. At least once a week, it should be the special gathering of the loved ones who have discovered the secrets and become the intimates of mysteries. It may assume any form even if it be a hole in the ground, that hole shall become even as a paradise of havens, an exalted meadow, and a garden of delight. So it's the same process, but at an embryonic level. And now, as you know from recent message of the House of Justice, we're about to embark on the next stage of this learning, which is the creation of national houses of worship and even local houses of worship in some of the more advanced clusters in the world. So another stage of our learning about this process of collective worship. So in this process of learning about growth now, it's become much clearer to us. What is it that we're supposed to be doing in, in some part of the world? How can we learn to be systematic in a cluster, establish a certain pattern that gradually can grow and advance and become systematic over time? So one of the aspects is this aspect of devotional life. But again, not just we have two devotional meetings, we need four devotional meetings. No, we have maybe 200 Baha'is in this cluster. So the question becomes, how do you create collective devotional life for 300 people? All the Baha'is and a good number of their friends. Well, that's going to take more than just a couple meetings. It's going to take all kinds of patterns, some big gatherings maybe at the local center, some small gatherings in homes in various neighborhoods and so on. We have to learn a lot about how to weave a pattern of devotional life that sets a different tone in a, in a community, in a cluster. In some of the clusters in Africa, they've reported where they've learned really to systematically expand this process of collective worship. In one village, 
area, uh, a, a chief came to the Baha'is and said, actually, people are coming to me less with their personal problems. And I think it has to do with the foundation of devotional life that Baha'is are being able to build in our cluster. People are engaged in this spiritual process. They learn to get together and, and interact with one another on a, on a more firm basis, and they don't have so many problems as before. We're learning about building an educational system through the training institute that begins with children at six years old, but has three different stages to it, all slightly different, but all interconnected, so that gradually we can take a young person from the age of six years old until they can enter the uh, uh, junior youth program from 12 to 14, where they get really insights and ca capabilities uh, to understand who they are as a contributor to a building of a new civilization. They see themselves in that role. They're able to withstand the forces of propaganda or tribalism or uh, uh, prejudice against women and so on. And they see a different way of interacting and a different way of being in the world. And then they enter the sequence of courses of the Institute and then they become capable workers who themselves then can educate the children before that, or, or who could become animators to guide the young people. Just like somebody guided them, they can guide somebody along this critical age of junior youth. So we have a system then that gradually can raise the capabilities of the friends and, 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 their, and the wider community to participate in a process of learning about civilization building. So the House of Justice explained this as a series of milestones. And now we can see we have about 15,000 clusters in the world. And no doubt you've uh, recently read the Rizvan message, seen this video, Frontiers of Learning, uh, it had a chance to explore the document of the International Teaching Center on Insights from the Frontiers of Learning. And you see that now, after almost a century of systematic work in learning how to put the teachings about growth into practice, actually we have a very clear idea. In this Lumumbashi cluster, they have 10,000 people participating in their activities. So essentially we know how to go from a cluster where there's not a single Baha'i and organize and begin and teach and create community life and invite people to participate with us and so on until we build up such a pattern that we can have 10,000 people, 7,000 in the educational system, 10,000 in the wider pattern of community action. Now the question just becomes, well, how do we do that in other places? How do we do that in more and more? Maybe there's a couple hundred clusters that we can get to that level but we have 15,000 clusters. Now the learning that's applied there, even if we don't learn anything else, well, imagine the day when what is happening in the Lumabashi cluster is actually the weakest cluster in the Baha'i world. Well, when will that be? You know, five years from now? Well, maybe not, but maybe 50 years from now. So the point is we know this pattern we just have to learn how to translate it to other places and work through the problems and work through the challenges. And then, of course, this most advanced cluster will advance even further. So we're seeing then uh, uh, in cluster after cluster how to develop the human resources who can carry out this work and how to organize a certain scheme of coordination to mobilize and deploy those human resources in order to carry out ever more effective patterns of action. And in the document from the Teaching Center, it talks about the characteristics of a sustained rhythm of expansion and consolidation, the emergence of a well-grounded educational process, the advances in community building, the effective organizational scheme, and the greater involvement in the life of society, which makes up this pattern of activity. And what we're seeing is it's not so much a pattern of activity but it's really a way of reaching out to people. So for example, even with a devotional meeting, the aim of my devotional meeting is not simply have a meeting that people come to and then I say, okay, I have an activity. But actually I'm creating an environment where people come and they're exposed to the word of God. And I'm very much interested in the experience of all those people. The activity is not an end in itself. The encounter with the people with other people, their spiritual journey is the purpose of that meeting. So some come and they're enriched by that opportunity to pray and it prepares them to go back and face their daily life and so on. 
Others come and they're open to other possibilities. They're uh, caught by the spirit of the devotional meeting. They want their children to learn more. So you can direct them toward children's class. Or they want to study more. They're uh, interested in a home visit or in entering a study circle and so on. So what we see is any of our activities, even the work of teaching, is not so much an event or an activity where I, the doer, am the center of it. But I'm creating a space where I look at people, I create an environment, they're exposed to the word of God, and then I try to accompany them and help them on their path. Even the process of teaching, the Bob said, is a process of helping people remove the veils so that they can progress along their own spiritual journey until they can recognize the manifestation of God. Even as all this learning, we see the video of Frontiers of Learning, we see how far we've actually gone to penetrate with this learning process. But still we find maybe in our own clusters, well, there's a lot of misconceptions and obstacles that are holding us back. Uh, For example, the House of Justice recently talked about the tendency, whenever there's a new thing that comes along, uh, there's a need to focus on that thing and learn how to do it. But sometimes we forget that where we're doing a whole bunch of things, this is one thing added to those things. And instead, our whole plan collapses into that one pattern of activity. So when we talk about working with youth and receptive populations in neighborhoods, then we get so interested in this new thing that then we forget that actually we're supposed to have activities all over the cluster. And those clusters are not just, I mean, those activities are not just limited to neighborhoods and so on. So those things also have to continue even as we learn the new thing. One of our tendencies is to collapse everything into a dichotomy and see one thing or the other. So, for example, uh, we have devotional meetings and we want to have those devotional meetings in neighborhoods. Suddenly it becomes no devotional meetings in local centers anymore. And so then it becomes a debate. Do we have meetings in local centers? Do we not have meetings in local centers? When then we lose track of the whole idea that really what we're trying to do is create devotional life for every single person in the cluster. So we pretty much need every place we can have a devotional meeting, but then we have smaller spaces and bigger spaces, and we learn how to create that pattern. So uh, when we're learning to do something new, one tendency is to try to collapse it in a formula or a recipe. So everybody has to do this exactly like this in this order in order for it to be effective. And then some of the friends say, well, no, I don't want to do it that way. I think we should do anything we want. And so then the debate becomes, is there one thing or is everything good? And the answer is that the resolution of most of these dichotomies is not answered in the either or. You have to kind of transcend the dichotomy, and then you start to see a bigger pattern where these various elements can be understood. So it's true that our action in the cluster should not collapse into some formula or recipe about how growth can take place. That won't work. That's not what the House of Justice asked for. But then that doesn't mean that the opposite is true, where everybody can do whatever they want. What we're trying to do is learn how to work together learn how in a spirit of learning through study, consultation, action, and reflection, where different people do different things. We appreciate the unity and diversity of the different actions we're called to, and we learn how to weave those different elements together in a pattern of vibrant growth. So it's like the idea of the individual human being. You know, we look at the human body. It's made up of many different cells. Not all those cells are doing the same thing. They do different things. Some do uh, certain organs, but then you also have to figure out how to organize those organs into certain systems. So gradually, the human body is composed of a unity and diversity of cells operating in different ways, which brings forth something that's greater than the sum of its parts. And the Baha'i community is attempting to do the same thing. Sometimes there's a need to focus on a particular thing. Like in the human body, when you have one cell, The idea is to focus on having more cells. You know, you can't go off to university and get a college degree as one cell. You need more cells. Then those cells have to organize themselves. Then they have to differentiate. Finally, a baby is born. But that baby still can't go off to college and get a degree. It's got to learn how to crawl. It's got to learn how to talk. So many different stages of development. Each stage has different requirements until the day does come 
when the child does go off the college and does get the degree, but only because the previous stages came before and were systematic. So this is the pattern that we're learning how to create. Again, described in the Rizvan message, described by the teaching center in its document. It's a cluster that's vibrant in its activity. Everybody is involved. Everybody is participating. As many people as possible are initiating activities. The types of their activity they're initiating are very diverse. They're the core activities, of course, but then, again, they're called core activities, not only activities. So around them also come other activities as well, but not just activities for the sake of doing something different because I li don't like core activities. Activities that are integrated and complement and reinforce the pattern that's being developed by the core activities themselves. All kinds of teaching activities, administrative work, social life, uh, social and economic development begins to emerge after a certain point. But all these things have to be woven together in a tapestry. It's not an either or of some uniform thing or anything goes. It's something that transcends that, and that's what the House of Justice is describing. Friends, these are uh, uh, three uh, distinct elements of what we have learned uh, in the past 90 years. What we didn't know, what we couldn't understand, what was inherent in Abdu'l Baha's will and testament and the other teachings, but which couldn't be manifested. And all of these three things, in a certain sense, combine into a pattern that we're now seeing where uh, we have, uh, in a certain sense, what you might call the Baha'i method of learning under the guidance of the Universal House of Justice, how to study the guidance, how to consult, how to act, how to reflect on that action, how that learning flows to the world center and then is organized in another stage of systematic guidance, and then we go out and carry out that work. So what we're starting to see in all this work is the fulfillment of the promises that are inherent in the teachings. For example, in one area, uh, we're starting to see um, this work uh, uh, manifested in uh, the area of social action. So we're learning about, uh, in one place, about the building of community schools. In, um, we have now 27 Baha'i-inspired agencies which are working to create community schools. There's more than 330 schools with over 800 teachers and 17,000 students operating in 137 clusters. And these community-based schools are actually becoming quite effective in reaching areas of the country that the government schools can't reach and in some countries are even becoming more effective than the government schools themselves in raising, for example, in the Central African Republic about a year or so ago, one study showed that those individuals who were involved in the fourth grade of the Baha'i-inspired community schools were performing at a higher level than the students in the sixth grade of the government-operated schools. So gradually, we're learning how to translate the teachings into a pattern of action in a systematic way uh, that proves to be effective. And this is not just the beginning. All right, this is a little thing, a pattern with schools. But this is also the vision that Abdu'l Baha had for the Baha'i schools in Iran, that the Baha'is would learn how to engage in education and raise children to such a degree of understanding that, that all of the people whatever their religious background, would want to send their children to the Baha'i schools. And so the Baha'i schools could become instrumental in educating the entire population. And they made, we know from history that they did make a certain mark in the history of that country. Well, now we're learning how to do that more systematically in one country after another. And then this is just the beginning of the process of systematically learning how to translate the teachings into action to begin to resolve and solve some of the problems of humanity. Abdu'l Baha said, our aim is to eliminate prejudice of all kinds from the face of the earth. Well, what do we know about eliminating racial prejudice, say, from the fabric of American society? Well, maybe we don't know how to do that, but we have to set in motion a systematic process of learning, look at these communities where we're growing, tackle this issue, and in the pattern of the fabric of these communities that we're raising, we have to learn how to eliminate this process. Now, this pattern of learning 
through action and reflection under the guidance of the House of Justice, puts us in a fundamentally different position than we were at the beginning of, the, uh, of this first century of the formative age. We saw how different turning points in the development of the faith left us confused. Suddenly, Abdu'l Baha passed away. Now we have the administration. Suddenly, Shoghi Effendi passes away. We no longer have a guardian. So we're confused, lots of questions, lots of confusion. Some people fall away and so on. In 1996, the House of Justice sets us on a new direction uh, of learning about systematic growth and so on. So what we can see now toward the end of this first century is actually this idea of change and development is not something surprising and shocking and some deviation from the organic development of the Baha'i faith. It is the organic development of the Baha'i faith that what the Baha'i faith is, is not my current level of understanding of it, but what's inherent in the guidance of the Universal House of Justice. And we have to trust the time and the guidance of the Universal House of Justice and our own action and learning in the shadow of that guidance to gradually learn how to advance the faith and carry it through all the stages of its development. Now, I want to close with uh, one idea, which it's a little bit long, but I, I think it's an important one. By the way, these are just some of the ideas which I think lessons you could draw from the first century of the formative age. And again, these are just some I think are most important. But you go and you look and you can see others. The relationship between crisis and victory. Um, the pattern that we're building between the three protagonists of individuals, communities, and institutions. Uh, we're learning how to get programs of growth going in every cluster in the world and so on. So there's many things that we have learned and that we'll continue to learn. But I want to focus again on this idea of the mindset that we should have as we approach these ideas. One of the things that Baha'u'llah talked about in his writings, which you know very well, is the concept of idle fancies and vain imaginings. So what is he talking about there? Essentially, what he's talking about is the ideas in our head. The reality of man is his thought, Abdu'l Baha said. So our understanding of the world around us is what we understand, what's trapped between you know, uh, our, our head, in, inside our head, the reality that we understand. So that's the perception we have about reality. Now the question is, is what we have in our mind actually uh, an actual reflection of reality or not? Well, mostly it's made up of a whole bunch of ideas which are partly true and partly not true and missing a whole bunch of reality about the way the world is and about the way that it should work. Even our ideas about the revelation of Baha'u'llah, Baha'u'llah's own teaching, are limited in their scope. We might read a number of books and think we know what Baha'u'llah taught, but Shoghi Effendi tells us that uh, to strive to obtain a more adequate understanding of the significance of Baha'u'llah's stupendous revelation remains the first obligation and object of the constant endeavor of each one of its lo loyal adherents. He said an exact and thorough comprehension of so vast a system, so sublime a revelation, so sacred a trust is for obvious reasons beyond the reach and ken of our finite minds. So we're human beings. Our minds are limited. Our grasp of reality is limited. We construct these images, our own idle fancies and vain imaginings about how reality works, how the Baha'i faith works, and so on. Baha'u'llah calls upon us to look at things through his eyes, to accept what he has given us, and to set aside our own idle fancies and vain imaginings about the world. Now, uh, this is not an easy process. We're told to trust the time and the guidance of the universal house of justice. But if we think we already know what the Baha'i faith is, if we think we already know how it operates, well, how can we be open to that guidance? How do we trust the time? How do we trust to that guidance if we think we already know? Now, we're well aware in our efforts to teach the faith to other people how obstacles arise when Baha'u'llah says something and the seeker already thinks something else. Their mind is full, it has an idea, and it doesn't accept Baha'u'llah's idea. In a very different way, the same problem arises if we, as the Baha'is, are sure that we know. And then, in the ongoing unfoldment of the faith, the House of Justice says something other than what we already understand. Or 
what somebody else says that the House of Justice is talking about. What we object to is our own, the, the thing that's in our own mind, our own perception of what's going on, not really to the guidance of the House of Justice, which we know is the source of truth about this. How easy it is for us to sit here and laugh about the mistakes that were made by Baha'is of an earlier generation who elected alternate members of the National Assembly. At one point, uh, the foremost Baha'i teachers in, the, in North America thought that the station of Abdu Baha was higher than the station of the Bab. That, of course, we know today. Every nine-year-old knows that's not true and so on. How foolish were people who uh, called into question the will and testament of Abdu Baha or challenged the guardian when he sought to establish the administrative order. Uh, how foolish were those who accepted the claims of Mason Remy uh, and, and uh, were misled by him? Uh, how short-sighted were those who, at the time of the 10-year crusade, could have arisen, could have become Knights of Baha'u'llah, but because their perception of reality was such, they didn't really understand and they didn't really grasp that opportunity. But it's much harder to see our own challenges and mistakes today. Uh, whether because of a certain limitation in grasping the vision or the possibilities of the current stage of the divine plan or in attempting to find our own place in the ranks of those who are promoting the plan. Now, in order to be able to help us uh, with this understanding, uh, we should consider a couple letters that Shoghi Effendi wrote in 1924, very early on now in his ministry within the first two years of his ministry. And um, at one point, you know, Shoghi Effendi being overburdened left the World Center of the Faith a couple times. And when I became a Baha'i, I always wondered about that. I thought, well, he's the guardian. Shouldn't he stay there and do his work and so on? I was kind of naive, didn't really understand it and so on. And recently I came across a letter of Shoghi Effendi from 1924. That, that kind of reveals new insights into this idea. He wrote, for the attention of all the Baha'is of the world, in both the East and the West, without any exception. And he said, my heart is so surging with emotion, and my spirit in such a state of turmoil, that straight away, picking up my pen, I am resolved to convey my true feelings and by means of these few words, each letter of which proceeds and springs from a wounded sensibility and a broken heart, to remonstrate, acutely pained and abashed as I am to do so, with the friends of both the East and the West. So he poured out his heart, explaining why he had to leave the World Center. Of course, Shoghi Effendi was overwhelmed by the great responsibilities that were thrust upon him by Abdu'l Baha. And he was also struggling with the actions of covenant breakers and so on, and was facing those challenges. But it wasn't either of these things that caused him to leave. What chiefly weighed on him was the action of the Baha'is themselves in response to their duties. He wrote to them, that which has chiefly given rise and primarily contributed to the anxiety and despondency of this downcast servant, aggravated the distress and anguish of this most great calamity, induced me regretfully to compose this letter and engendered diverse problems is none other but the lack of true fellowship and cooperation among his loved ones. And he cited specifically the signs of disunity, of negligence and neglect, of lack of cooperation, of carelessness, of rivalry, and of grievance about the contents and purport of the messages received. So even grievance about the guidance that Shoghi Effendi gave them to guide their affairs. What was happening was with this new framework of the administration organizing the affairs of the community around local and national assemblies, what was happening was those friends who were elected to membership on the assemblies 
were using that membership to do the things they wanted to do. So they would use their power on that administration to guide the affairs of the faith, not in the direction that it needed to go, not as a servant of the community, but to serve their own interests. And those who were not elected to the institutions were refusing to abide by the direction of the institutions of the faith. So you had a great deal of confusion, not from outside the faith, but from within, from the Baha'is not even understanding what they were called upon to do. And basically, those who had instruments designed to create the healing of the world were misusing those instruments and creating all kinds of problems and discord and disunity, the opposite of the reason these instruments were given. So he said, under these present conditions, it is not possible for me to attend to important matters. I have therefore of a necessity chosen to remove myself to a secluded corner. Until the sweet breath of fellowship and amity, of concord and unity is wafted abroad and reaches the nostrils of this yearning and expectant exile, there has been, nor shall there ever be, any hope. But then expressing his confidence in the assurance of divine assistance and the ultimate achievement of the aims of the faith, he appealed to the friends once more to get, dedicate themselves to their responsibility with love and fellowship until such time, he said, as the universal house of justice shall have stepped forth from the realm of hope into that of visible fulfillment. Then, he said, that august body, the recipient of the bounties of God and his inspiration, will proceed to devise and carry out important undertakings, worldwide activities, and the establishment of glorious institutions. By this means, the renown of the cause of God will become worldwide, and its light will illumine the whole earth. And right about the same time was a second letter sent to the Baha'is here in North America by Shoghi Effendi. And th th it's a little long. I, first of all, I encourage you to read it yourself. It's pr printed in Baha'i administration. It's a letter of February 23rd, 1924. But he expresses some of these same sentiments in a different way, calling upon the Baha'is and encouraging them to act in a certain way. He writes at the beginning of the letter that he gathers from various sources in the world that uh, there are certain kind of obstacles and problems that appeared that have retarded the progress of the faith. He said, I've learned with feelings of sadness and surprise that some vague sense of apprehension, a strange misconception of its immediate purpose and methods is slowly gaining ground, steadily affecting its wholesome growth and vigorous development throughout the continent. Through such, though such signs should appear from time to time, and however unrepresentative they may be of the vast and growing mass of its convinced and zealous supporters the world over, what, I wonder, could have caused this uneasiness of mind? Are such misgivings possible, though on the part of but a few, in the face of the remarkable manifestations of so remarkable a movement? To what extent do they form a part of those mental tests and trials destined at various times by the Almighty to stir and reinvigorate the body of his cause? And how far are they traceable to our imperfect state of understanding, to our weaknesses and failings? Then he told the Baha'is that the plight of mankind, the conditions and circumstances under which we live, are truly disheartening, and that these, the prejudice, the ill will, is enough to chill the stoutest heart. He said these passions and these forces were growing stronger every day, and that uh, what the Baha'i community uh, needed to do was provide that source of love and guidance which springs uh, from the word of God. What let us ask ourselves, he said, should be our attitude as we stand under the all-seeing eye of our vigilant master, gazing at a sad spectacle so utterly remote from the spirit he breathed into the world. Are we to be carried away by the flood of hollow and conflicting ideas, or are we to stand unsubdued and unblemished upon the everlasting rock 
of God's divine instructions. Shall we not equip ourselves with a clear and full understanding of their purpose and implications for the age in which we live, and with an unconquerable resolve, arise to utilize them intelligently and with scrupulous fidelity for the enlightenment and promotion of the good of all mankind? And then he concludes, humanity torn with dissension and burning with hate is crying at this hour for a fuller measure of that love which is born of God, that love which in the last resort will prove the one solvent of its incalculable difficulties and problems. And as we make an effort to demonstrate that love to the world, may we also clear our minds of any lingering trace of unhappy misunderstandings that might obscure our clear conception of the exact purpose and methods of this new world order, so challenging and complex, yet so consummate and wise. We are called upon by our beloved master in his will and testament, not only to adopt it unreservedly, but to unveil its merit to all the world, to attempt to estimate its full value and grasp its exact significance after so short a time since its inception would be premature and presumptuous on our part. We must trust the time and the guidance of God's universal house of justice to obtain a clearer and fuller understanding of its provisions and implications. But one word of warning must be uttered in this connection. Let us be on our guard, lest we measure too strictly the divine plan with the standard of men. I'm not prepared to state that it agrees in principle or in method with the prevailing notions now uppermost in men's minds, nor that it should conform with those imperfect, precarious, and expedient measures fervishly resorted to by an agitated humanity. Are we to doubt that the ways of God are not necessarily the ways of men? Is not faith but another word for implicit obedience, wholehearted allegiance, uncompromising adherence to that which we believe is the revealed and expressed will of God? However perplexing it might first appear, however at variance with the shadowy views, the impotent doctrines, the crude theories, the idle imaginings, and the fashionable conceptions of a transient and troublous age. If we are to falter or hesitate, if our love for him should fail to direct us and keep us within his path, if we desert divine and emphatic principles, what hope can we any more cherish for healing the ills and sicknesses of this world? Thank you very much, friends. <clears throat>